Welcome to Conversation. Today we have a very special guest for you. Uh, this is my very good friend Patrick Ho. Hello. Both him and I, you know, we love movies and we actually had a show together. So, um, so Pat, could you tell the audience uh, about yourself? About myself? Oof. Um, well, in terms of movies, so I've been, um, I've been a big movie lover since I was a little kid, probably since elementary school, and um, and from there I started writing a lot of movie reviews. Because for whatever reason, um, I was never interested in making movies. I was interested in thinking about movies and writing about movies. So um, I've done movie reviews for WHRW here on campus, uh, BTV, and um, three or four different publications all about movies and I don't know, I guess just like live and breathe mm -hmm. movies. Me and Patrick, we have very different aesthetics. Mm -hmm. um, I tend to favor more mainstream. I like all genres of movies, but Pat has a nick for a lot of indie films um, or just in the sense as he claims he likes good movies. <laughs> I think there's a, um, when you say mainstream movies, you're mm -hmm. already putting it, there's kind of a, um, stigma to just saying mainstream movies because I don't think I don't think what I like is not mainstream per se I just like movies that are good and interesting and for whatever reason mainstream movies are oftentimes not interesting because they have to follow a certain mold a certain model a certain thing and once you're starting to see that pattern in certain things it becomes a, well, what's the point of watching that? Yeah, it becomes very, you know, very generic. Mm -hmm. You know, in a sense, movies, you know, quote unquote mainstream, tend to be very high budget. Usually to make a, a decent movie is about $100 million. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these corporations, whether it's Universal, Fox, or Sony, they have to, you know, sort of secure the investment. A lady by the name of Linda uh, Earps, um, author of Sleepless, Sleepless in Hollywood, um, she was on Free Zakaria mm -hmm. show. And uh, she says the cost for advertising is so high. Well, Hollywood does nowadays is do sequels. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you have the advent of just, you know, a lot of sequels and very generic stuff because once the audiences have, you know, a certain uh, movie that they like, they're most likely going to want to see a second one. And that sort of takes away some of the art in a way. I disagree with the sequel thing because sequels and mm -hmm. uh, um, adaptations, because people. People since the 80s, um, mm -hmm. people for a long time have been saying like, oh, there's always, there's too many sequels in Hollywood, there's too many adaptations in Hollywood. That's the thing, the thing is that that's always been the case. In the 30s, you had seven Thin Man movies. Mm -hmm. You had, um, you just had a lot of different movies. I think the, I think something that um, Opes is kind of touching upon there is the fact that movies are so expensive now that there's just less movies being made, mm -hmm. uh, less mainstream movies being made. Um, there's still a lot of movies being made. You're seeing um, every week, you're seeing about 20 different releases, whether it's indie movies, foreign films, and things like that. And um, because there are less movies being made, you're taking a bigger risk on each movie being made. Mm -hmm. So um, if we're making, let's say, um, Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice, and that costs about two hundred million dollars to make. You have to make sure that that is a movie that people want to see, mm -hmm. or else that's the only way to justify that high of a cost. There's not a lot of thirty million dollar movies being made before. Um, like if you look at what won the, uh, if you look at some of the big movies of the mid '90s, those movies would not be mainstream movies today. Jerry, I can't imagine Jerry Maguire, mm -hmm. which is this huge hit being made today by a major studio. Spotlight, which is an independent film, mm -hmm. would have been a, a probably universal release in the mid-90s. Well, a lot, well, the argument that Herbs makes, she actually references mm -hmm. the 90s movies, that movies in the 90s were better in the sense that you had writers that could do original screenplays. And one of the problems is that you have um, something like Marvel, right? Yeah. That, you know, they release certain movies um, except for big directors like Christopher Nolan or James Cameron, it's really hard for an original script besides, you know, Quentin Tarantino for it to be made and for it to be given a green light. Well, I also, I also kind of disagree with that too because I think 
Maybe, maybe if we're talking about major studios, yes, major studios. But once again, it's about that risk factor. But then again, um, in the mid 90s, I don't think, I think Opes is also saying that, I think what bothers me is about what Opes just said is that movies were better in the mid 90s because of that. Because you're also getting a lot of crap from original screenwriters. Like, for example, Joe Esterhaus was paid, like, an exorbitant amount of money to write Showgirls, which is generally considered like one of the worst movies ever made. But maybe, I guess, what the big superhero movies are doing is they're gobbling up, or the big franchise movies, is that they're gobbling up all of the talented people they can. Because they know, it's almost like, it's almost like you make a good independent film, you're gobbled up by the big studio people. For example, um, Jurassic World uh, had Colin Trevorrow, who directed um, a small indie movie called Safety Not Guaranteed, and they got put him up. Ryan Johnson, who's going to direct the next Star Wars movie, directed um, Looper, which was a semi was a was a studio movie, but he was known for indie stuff like um, Brick and The Brothers Bloom, and he was gobbled up by more. he was gobbled up by Disney to do the next Star Wars movie. So they're looking at all these talents um, coming, a lot of them coming from the independent movie world, and just gobbling them up in or and trying to get those funnel those talented people in, which is kind of disappointing because then you're not seeing them make something original because they have a unique way of thinking and yeah. movie making. Yeah, that's pretty, I understand that point. Um, the revenue from, you know, Blockbuster, when, you know, remember when the late fees, mm -hmm. no more late fees were really excited. Um, and I think movies in general, um, they're having a lot of revenue problems as compared to, you know, a lot of the revenue stream has gone to, was it, uh, Redbox, mm -hmm. Netflix, and a whole bunch of other options. When you look at the market itself, a lot of money comes from the international market, comes from yep. China, yep. you know, Japan, mm -hmm. and a lot of it, like, like Jerry Maguire, a lot of the American style movies, yes. if you take it to China or Indonesia, they really won't understand it. Which is last year, Straight Outta Compton made um, over 200 million domestically and made close to nothing overseas because that doesn't necessarily, um, a story about NWA doesn't necessarily appeal to a global audience. That's very true, yeah. Now, uh, for our audiences, you know, we don't want to get too technical, but let's take a step back here mm -hmm. and really define what makes uh, indie from a, a mainstream. And it's not only budget, but I define a lot of it, you know, it's really the Academy Awards. And that's also another issue in a sense that, for instance, the Academy Awards tends to discriminate against mainstream movies. And, you know, one of my biggest beefs was when The Hurt Locker uh, beat Avatar for, you know, Best Picture. Um, and it's sort of disappointing because I think um, art is being taken over. And, and, and they just say, you know, for example, somebody like Shia LaBeouf uh, was in Transformers. And he says that he'll never do another blockbuster movie because it, it was controlling. Now, Michael Bay has his own issues, mm -hmm. but um, it's sort of disappointing when you have great artists, you know, saying that they, they want, you know, less CGI, that they want to be actors. And there is this stigma and this division between art movies that are, are artistic, which the general public doesn't see. I doubt people saw Spotlight, you know, I doubt people saw other movies besides Mad Max. So what happens is, you know, the Academy Awards is out of touch, and, you know, you, you, um, you add that with, of course, the race issue. I think it's just the overall thing of you have two different worlds, you know. Yeah. People who are artistic and want certain experimental films, um, which gets recognized by academies, but then you have the MTV Movie Awards that you know most of the general public sees. So you know, but do they see the MTV Movie Awards? Um, do people really watch? I mean, are, maybe not the MTV Movie Awards, but I, mean, I get what you're saying. But um, I, I do think that there is an issue between um, um, there's always been a division between high culture and low culture, mm -hmm. and the Academy Awards is very much in guilty in picking movies that they think will make them look best because mm -hmm. they want a certain movie to define the narrative. That's why a movie like Crash beat Brokeback Mountain because the narrative about Crash was a better narrative. That said, like, what you're saying, I don't know, I just don't agree about what you're saying about something like Spotlight because I think one of the functions of the Academy Award is that it sheds a light on on smaller movies like Room and um, 
The problem with Spotlight is that it's such a, this should be a mainstream movie. This, should, this is all the makings of a studio movie, but it's not because studios don't want to make this movie anymore. Mm -hmm. This is like the perfect um, mid um, $30 million movie to be out there, yet it was made for 10 or 15. And you're, calling, and you're also calling these independent films more experimental, the ones that get recognized by the Academy, but they're also not. Mm -hmm. Room Room is as straightforward as it comes. It's, um, it's um, um, cinematically speaking, it follows like, all the conventions, it follows norms, I mean, maybe, maybe uh, it doesn't follow plot beats as you would expect it to, but it still follows, I, I still think that it follows everything. Because it would be another thing if they were recognizing movies like The Forbidden Room, mm -hmm. which is this um, crazy Guy Madden movie that is this um, true experiment. That, then I would agree with you, but these independent films are not that different. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess it comes down to um, really how we define a movie. So yeah. for, for instance, like for my definition of movie, it, it is to convey truth, you know, okay. like, like, like the theater. It is sometimes, you know, uh, the saying goes that we have to use, you know, lies to tell truth. Yeah. Um, and something like Straight Outta Compton, I think for, for what it was, it told the truth of the African American hip hop culture, right? And I think that was the truth that, yes, it made a lot of money, but I think that's something that should have been recognized. I think what the Academy does, you know, and uh, Trevor Noor had a skit about mm -hmm. this, where you sprinkle some slavery sauce, or yeah. you sprinkle some, you know, some, you know, Martin Luther King in but there. But that goes to the narrative yeah. of the Academy Awards again. Like, the reason why um, The Revenant was so loved is because they're like, oh, there's this movie making. People are it actually in the mountains suffering through cold. There are the Caprios eating real live um, buffalo liver. The Academy wants to recognize that because they're like, oh, this is how a movie should be. Look at that. That's um, you're struggling for your art. But I mean, does that really make a good movie? Not really. Yeah. When the Academy Awards um, had James Franco and you know, Anne Hathaway, that was a pretty low, you know, rating year. You know, they tried to appeal to a younger audience, um, and I think younger audience just wants to be represented. And I think certain movies just don't tell their story. And of course, certain movies are important, but I think I really am looking for the marriage of art and mainstream. Okay. And I think somebody like Christopher Nolan really does a great job. Okay. Directors like him, David Fincher, movie like Gone Girl, mm -hmm. where you have that cinematic element, you know, that pace, um, and you have that buildup. And I think Hollywood should focus on that, should recognize that more. Well, the thing about that, though, is also that, um, Hollywood's also not allowing that to happen. Once again, I was saying like independent filmmakers are being gobbled up by big franchises to make their movies, right? So um, if we're talking about like something like Guardians of the Galaxy, which I'm not a big fan of, um, James Gunn is this super idiosyncratic filmmaker. He's he's just a strange dude. Mm -hmm. And if you watch his previous works like Super, Slither, or Romeo and Juliet, you recognize that he has a weird way of thinking. Yet Guardians of the Galaxy looks like every other Marvel movie. It just looks like that blob, um, that blob gray slab that you expect from all the other Marvel movies. And then um, there, you, um, Edgar Wright, who directed Scott Pilgrim vs. the World, Hot Fuzz, um, Shaun the Dead, had um, left Ant-Man because he wasn't allowed to creatively breathe in the way that he wanted to. And he was going to make Ant-Man, which the thing is like, you, you're right, but unless for Christopher Nolan or David Fincher, directors are not being allowed to do their thing in these big budget movies. That's why oftentimes they go off and do their own thing. I mean, Mark Duplass, who's a great independent filmmaker, and he's also in a lot of t TV shows. Um, um, he's on um, the mini project. Um, he says, like, there's no excuse. Um, because of technology, there's no excuse for people just not to make movies on their own anymore. And I think that's where you're seeing the like, proliferation of indie stuff, whether it's like the spotlights, which the spotlights, which um, has lots of stars, to the mumblecore movies of Joe Swanberg and the Duplass brothers. Mm -hmm. And it's just a different thing because I don't, 
I don't because the thing about the Academy Awards is that it's also what Hollywood decides that they want to promote. Because Creed is a great movie. Mm -hmm. Creed is was one of my favorite films of last year. And it's a and I believe it's a perfect pop movie. And there's no reason why it shouldn't have been nominated for more Academy Awards than it did. But the only reason it didn't was because um, whoever studio released Creed, I feel like it's Warner Brothers, but I could be wrong there, um, decided that it wasn't really an Oscar movie, so they didn't really campaign for it. And that's a problem. They don't, some studios don't campaign for these movies that you want, because if you don't think Transformers is an Oscar movie you, and you don't campaign for it, why would people want to vote for Transformers? Mm -hmm. Now, you know, in terms of directors being controlled, um, the director of Fantastic Four, mm -hmm. um, Josh Trank. Yeah, Josh Trank. Um, he was one of those, you know, he came out of um, Chronicles, mm -hmm. which was a very brilliant movie, you know, done using sort of real life cameras. Mm -hmm. um, and the studio really gave him the key. And he wanted his own vision, but the studio was sort of hovering yeah. over him just because, you know, again, this is a $150 million yeah, exactly. investment. Um, and I guess studios do take a chance. You know, if you have somebody, you know, the Star Wars director, D.J. Abrams, who, of course, you know, he has a litany of stuff. And even him, he was scared when he released Star Wars because, you know, what the studio is going to think. So, you know, there is that big brother feel. Now, um, what a lot of actors have been doing to get a chance to breathe and to be more expressive is going into television. And television, they're calling this the golden age of television. Yeah. Um, just because of the different roles and really because of Netflix and because of binge watching, you're able to do more complex shows. Television is a writer's medium. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a show that's run by the writers um, and it's not really a filmmaker's medium. I mean, shows like Breaking Bad has amazing film qualities. It's more about story. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, in, in terms of mediums, it's very interesting. You said um, television is a writer's medium. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Charlie Rose always says that, you know, film is the director's medium yes. and theater is the actor's medium. Mm -hmm. And I think you're absolutely right, um, adding to that, that television is the writer's medium. And the writers, of course, often not appreciated, you know, but um, writing is important. I think, you know, even in terms of, you know, this can be um, really translated into film again in the sense of writing more complex characters um, for different groups of people. Um, and again, that goes back to the issue of diversity. Uh, now, what are your thoughts in terms of, you know, diversity in movies and seeing more characters, you know, more movies that are not whitewashed, per se? Oh, where did that be started? Well, the thing about, the thing about diversity in movies is just this perception that um, we want to see certain faces and certain group of people, and especially with African American actors and even Hispanic, um, even Latino actors. Unless you get to a certain point in your career, you're just not going to be cast for certain roles. There's only like a certain bar that you have to pass in order to be cast in certain things. So we're talking about like the Denzel Washingtons, the Don Cheadles, the Benicio del Toros, and it takes a long time for them to even reach that bar. Don Cheadle was just was doing bit parts until until the mid-90s when people started to realize. But then you're having all these great um, black actors out there who are not getting cast in these roles for a reason. And then when you are cast in a mainstream Hollywood role, oftentimes it's um, the same type of roles all, all over again. It's either gangbangers or a maid. Like, did you watch the, um, the Brothers Grimsby, the new Sacha Baron Cohen movie? Uh, no, I have to, I have to catch that. Oh, don't catch it. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, but it's like, so Gabrielle so Sidibe is an amazing actor, and she, and, and she looks a certain way, so obviously can't disconnect what she looks like, but she, this is the third or fourth time I've seen her play a black maid in a movie. Mm -hmm. And just how many times can you have the, uh, can you have a bigger black maid portrayed in a movie, and why is it always a black maid? I'm, I'm sure it's supposed to take place in South Africa, but like, why Gabrielle to the Bay is so funny. Mm -hmm. She is a great actress, and she is just really funny. Mm -hmm. So there's no reason why she can't be anything else, and it's just really tough to to watch um, 
a certain group of people who constantly play the same thing over and over and over again. And the fact of the matter is, like, people will go watch a... People will go watch a, a movie starring an African-American lead. Mm -hmm. But oftentimes, Hollywood thinks that those are only African-Americans. I was watching, once again, going back to Creed. Mm -hmm. Creed should be the... It's a Rocky movie. It should be this mainstream... Um, thing and then and it made a good amount of money, it made about a hundred and eighty million dollars. Except the trailers before it was all black centric movies. It was Barbershop too. It was two Kevin Hart movies. But there's no reason why you should only be selling this movie to a certain demographic of people. This movie should be made for everyone because it is made for everyone. And everyone that I've talked to, no matter what they are, likes that movie. But Hollywood has this perception that just because it's a movie starring and written and directed by an African-American, it's a black-centric movie that should be only marketed towards black people. Mm -hmm. And that is very problematic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, yeah, you make a very um, valid point. And I know, um, you know, another concern was, you know, Ridley Scott, he said that, you know, he would not want to risk, you know, a $150 million movie on somebody named, you know, Mohammed or, or somebody like that. Um, and you, know, you have that argument where people say, well, you know, if you're, in, you know, if the story takes place in Ireland, you're going to need somebody with white, with red hair. But, you know, you have certain sure. movies like Gods of Egypt, which bombed, um, you know, um, Exodus, which sort of bombed, which people are upset that, again, it was whitewashed. Um, mm -hmm. And it goes back to that point. Now, in terms of black movies, um, even the black community itself has sort of criticized movies like Medea movies, Kevin yeah. Hart movies. They tend to be sort of the same. The general audience might go to movies, let's say, twice a month, yeah. if, if that. Me and you will go to a movie maybe three times in the week or four times in the yeah. week. I think with, with that sense, it's, once again, it's uh, studios thinking that um, an African-American-centric uh, African movies must look a certain way. Mm -hmm. And that's why you have movies like A Soul Plane mm -hmm. or A um, Ride Along 2 or whatever, because they think that in order for this to appeal to a certain community, it has to look so. And I mean, it, it does to a certain sense, mm -hmm. but that's not on them. Because if you're, so here's the thing like, if they're being fed potatoes every day, you're just going to eat potatoes every day. If your mom makes potatoes every day, mm -hmm. you're going to eat potatoes. So if the students are just making, um, uh, making um, barbershops and um, soap planes, mm -hmm. or what? and I want to see myself represented, mm -hmm. then I'm going to go see those. Now, um, one of the movies that me and my uh, two brothers, we spent a lot of money to go see um, The Raid 2. Okay. And this was a, you know, an Indonesian movie mm -hmm. that sort of came out of nowhere. And I'm a big action fan. I grew up an action fan. And, um, you know, a lot of international movies are making their way here, which is very, um, was very, you know, rewarding because we get to see different cultures. Yeah. Like Jackie Chan in China and Jackie Chan uh, in Hong Kong and Jackie Chan in America is a completely different Jackie Chan. Jet Li in Hong Kong and Jet Li in America is a completely mm -hmm. different entity. And they're oftentimes, they're, uh, even when they're just movies, they're still marginalized mm -hmm. and put on the back burner. Mm -hmm. You don't see Jackie Chan ever get the ever get the girl in his movies. You see Owen Wilson get Lucy Liu. You see Chris Tucker get whoever the female is in Rush Hours. Jet Li loses the girl to TMX. <laughs> Jet Li, um, so the thing is like there, like Hollywood does not know what to do with these international stars. That's why um, Andy, um, Andy Lau, who is one of the biggest Chinese box office stars, says like, I don't need to make a Hollywood movie. Why should I? Um, why should I when I'm not going to be allowed to do anything, really? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of, oh, that's kind of frustrating because how do you know unless we're exposed to it? Now, um, since me and you are both Binghamton students and mm -hmm. there's a lot of people in cinema who want to get into Hollywood, okay. um, you know, in, ter yeah, in terms of that path, you know, you have, again, we talked about you know, cameras are now, you can do a lot with editing. Yeah. I use Premiere Pro. Mm -hmm. And like any other art form, whether it be modeling or whether it be acting, you need a portfolio. Yeah. And I guess one of the things, you know, you could do is of course, make a movie yourself, even yeah. if it's a low budget, and then take it to these, you know, um, festivals and hope you're picked. 
I mean, look at what BTV Film 48 is doing. It's putting the initiative out there to say, like, hey, Binghamton Film students are constantly complaining about how experimental the Binghamton Film Department is. Um, here, make a movie in 48 hours that includes editing, that's includes filming and editing the whole, the whole thing. And the thing is, like, we can, and we should, and you can make lots of good stuff from it. And there's no reason why you shouldn't. Like before, it was harder because you you could you had to edit with a lab. You had to actually cut and paste film strips together. But now I don't have an editing system on my computer. I just go to Bartle and I start editing with iMovie, which is a terrible system, but it's good enough for what I want to do, and I can do that. So there's no reason why any any film student should not just make any movie themselves and that way you can also know how to work within the means that the means that you have you could probably make a decent um 10 minute short with just volunteers and probably less than a hundred dollars i've made shorts like that i don't know if they're good but i've made shorts um for no money for literally i spent nothing on it i just stole locations. You made a very good point that a lot of Binghamton students um, who are in cinema, they've told me personally that they hate the experimental side of this um, college in the sense that they want the cinema department to have somebody that's actually worked in Hollywood that actually knows the cinema. Because to be quite frank with you, if you do graphic design or if you did cinema, you know, if you're really trying to make a living, you're going to have to perhaps come, up, come by or mid or, you know, big level studio. Do you think the school has an obligation to these students to teach them sort of the ways of Hollywood? However much we dislike it, but if you want to be a filmmaker, you know, Hollywood is in a sense the highest peak you can do that. <sighs> okay, so for those, here's my thing about the cinema department, because I personally love the cinema department. So for those coming into Binghamton, and going to the cinema department and thinking that they're going to learn um, how to make a narrative film, that's on them for not doing the research about the rich history our cinema department has. That just means like you didn't get into NYU film school. Because if you want to learn how to make studio films, go to NYU, go to USC. But our cinema department was founded by the biggest names of experimental film. You have your Ken Jacobs, who is coming on April 20th, Peter Kabelka. Things, uh, people like that. These guys are like on the Mount Rushmore of the experimental film. And the thing is, like, if you want to make, if you want to make movies, you should know how movies work. And what our cinema department does is that it it breaks it down into a into a theory level because you know everyone knows a simple A B C um, plot structure. Everyone knows how to break down into acts. And even if you don't know, you know because you've been watching it all your life. So what experimental film does is that it breaks it down it breaks it down and changes your perception of it. And it's almost like you're breaking down a car to its just its parts. The engine's just its parts. And that's the only way you can totally understand because if you just look at an engine, you can't understand that at all. But if you break it down into like little pieces and stuff, then you can truly understand how films work. And we're also not, and the cinema department also does not just teach experimental films. Maybe it teaches how to make experimental films, but, but it teaches theory. And I can't believe how often I just see cinema students just not care about watching these great movies from around the world. Cause we're, and they're not even showing like weird stuff. They're showing stuff like Susan Cain or um, Pedro Almodovar or Paul Thomas Anderson and people just aren't caring and that's very heartbreaking to me because because how do you expect to go into a medium if you don't truly love the medium and you're constantly complaining about like why you have to watch The Last Train to Mariband which is one of which is one of the greatest world cinema films that you can make because then, then how can you truly understand what you're making if you're not taking these things to bed. You don't have to like it necessarily, but just at least care enough to watch it mm -hmm. and think about it. Yeah, I, I agree that, of course, students should watch it and they should care about it, but the purpose of school, I believe, is of course to get an education, but also is to get a job. You know, if you're being, yeah. you know, if you're being 100, if you're being realistic. Um, and I think that, of course, the experimental film, you know, it gives you a different perspective because everything is about perspective. There's no one way to do things. 
but I think a university should have diversity. So you have, of course, you're gonna have the big names in experimental, but I also think they should have at least one or two people who are, you know, in that um, Hollywood culture. So here's the thing also, is like if you want to be realistic, how many of these people are going to go make movies in Hollywood, right? Yeah. More often than not, um, kids coming out of our cinema department, they're going to go and become videographers. Mm -hmm. They're probably going to go film someone's wedding. They're probably going to go film a press conference somewhere. I mean, sadly, that's like what it is. All the famous Hollywood people that's come out of our program has come out of Creative Writing Program, and that's because they write their own stuff mm -hmm. and make their own stuff. So if you want to be, so if you're following that logic, if you want to be, uh, if you want to make movies for a living, become, um, you can be in our cinema department, but you can also be in Creative Writing, because really there's no excuse to not write your own stuff if you feel like you can't get anything made and make your own thing. I really do think in order to become a good movie maker, a good thinker about movies, you just need to watch a lot of movies. Mm -hmm. And I'm just constantly disappointed by how little people have watched. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have, you're one of the people that have watched a lot of, a lot of movies. Even, you know, my sort of, I cut off in like 1950s, but you go way before that. Because there's good stuff out there. There's always, um, another thing that, um, another pet peeve of mine, this always when sounds like, oh, I'm flipping all through all these Netflix verses, and there's never seems to be anything good. Like, there's so many good things on there. You just have to go out and look for them. And people are so often just close-minded on what is what is a good movie because you're just so used to, once again, something like if you're used to potatoes, if you're introduced to something else, you'll find it weird. And they're not weird. Once again, like, I, I know you, we were talking about Spotlight earlier. You have this idea of, like, oh, Spotlight's an independent film. The Oscars only award films a certain way. Spotlight is as mainstream as they come, but people have this perception of it because they think of it as a different type of movie when it's not a different type of movie. You know, when I was watching um, NFL, um, it's a... The Concussion? Concussion? No, 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 oh. not Concussion. Um, oh, and, uh, Hard Knocks. Yeah, Hard Knocks, thank you. Um, and uh, one of the coaches for the Falcons, he was like, um, you know, why would I want to go see, you know, an uh, uh, Oscar movie? This is like depressing. And it, it really, that phrase really got to me in the sense that, you know, there is a lot of, movies do tell us serious issues. Of course, that indie uh, winner, um, Golden River, was mm -hmm. really shed a light on, you know, the, the documentarian, really shed a light on issues around the world. But realistically, the average person, and again, you know, the average person is not going to go see a really depressing movie. You know. And my whole thing is if you want to bridge that gap, so if you, again, you eat potatoes all your life, that's all you know, well, maybe you should try potato salad first, and then maybe, you know, you sort of ease into it. And what I don't like is that people already draw bridges. They say, like, I'm experimental. Oh, my God, Hollywood is disgusting. Or yeah. Hollywood people say, what's that? That's not even entertaining. So I feel like we should find ways, even within the university, to say, okay, you think this movie's good. Think about this movie. Or this movie, let's say something like The Dark Knight, it's one of my favorite movies. It uses this type of elements. And these type of elements originate from A, B, or C. So it, it, it's sort of like teaching through language in a sense that you teach um, our generation through the movies you've already watched. 121 does that. 121 shows, um, goes from the silent era to the digital era. Mm -hmm. and talks about how digital is being used today. Mm -hmm. It shows inception. It shows, uh, it shows those things. So why are so many students unhappy? I mean, it, it, it seems... Because like I think they want... I think it's a close-mindedness to, mm -hmm. to that. I think they came into the cinema department thinking a certain perception. I think they think they want it to be like NYU with the price of being Pennington mm -hmm. when it's a, when it's its own idiosyncratic thing. And and to be fair, like some of the students love the program, mm -hmm. um, but I think they they just thought it was going to be something else. And um, but to speak to you on the other parts, mm -hmm. things like student once again students just aren't giving us that a wider rate of things either, mm -hmm. like. How many romantic comedies are coming out? There's not a lot. Uh, yeah, not a lot. Yeah. And like, we're not getting romantic comedies anymore. Maybe we get like two or three a year, but that's less than all the superhero movies are getting. Mm -hmm. So that's really like my problem. It's like, 
give us more. Mm -hmm. Give us these. Give us these movies that should be made. Like we're getting. We're getting. We're getting like seventeen dystopian movies a year. We're getting. We just got Allegiant. We just saw the fifth wave bomb and fail. We're gonna get another Maze Runner movies. Hunger Games just ended. That I've already just named five that was released in the past year, and there's definitely more. Mm -hmm. So why can't? Why am I not seeing? Why am I not seeing girl falls in love with boy anymore? I guess you do see it. Uh, I mean, I feel like every movie is like a romance movie. I feel like every movie has, you know, the you have the protagonist, and then you have you know a female. But you know, we're not uh, seeing movies made for adults. Mm -hmm. We're just not seeing. We're just not seeing movies about grown ups, <laughs> like real grown ups, like going through grown-up things. Like, even if they're not really going through grown-up things, they're going through grown-up things. Sort of like uh, Office Space was one of my favorite movies. It was sort exactly. Of, it was sort of like, um, or I think Seinfeld really captured that imagination of, you know, using realism in the sense that everyday, you know, seeing everyday life, um, sort of like The American was sort of like a movie like that, you know, the average life of like an assassin or something like that. Yeah, which um, is, yeah. And like everything just feels like it's being um, targeted towards the teen audience. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like even superhero movies, I mean, they're kind of for grown ups, but they're also really for the mm -hmm. teenagers. Like the teenage boy. How about uh, Deadpool? Was that? It's still it's a, it's a movie with teenage humor. I'm sure it's rated R, but still like goes for teen. I'm sure there were a lot of fifteen year olds who went to watch it, despite the fact that it's rated R, mm -hmm. and I'm sure they loved it. But there's just really not movies for groups. Like, I kind of want to see more movies about a guy who works in an office. Because <laughs> why not? Because that's different at this point. Mm -hmm. The informant, I mm -hmm. think, yeah, you don't get a lot. Or like Spotlight, it's about a bunch of journalists. They're just journalists trying to do a job. Mm -hmm. And we don't get any, we're not getting any um, Hollywood movies about journalists mm -hmm. anymore. And, you know, one of my theories that, you know, I'm writing in my book is that um, this, is, this is like sort of like a separation between, um, I guess when you go to a movie, you should want to escape reality. And, you know, movies is sort of like an escape. And, you know, even if you look at the, you know, the horror, you know, the horror, you know, gene, in a sense that we don't want a dystopian society, but we do want to see how it would look like. And I think movies sort of exasperate our fears and it sort yeah. of amplifies no, it our aspirations. So I think in a sense that there is beauty in finding, you know, something unique and inspirational in normal life. But again I think it's also we go to a movie like something like um like Avengers and you see how it's made and you see you sort of you're sort of like in awe of the way they did it. And of course you have like Bill O'Reilly on the screen of um, you know, um, of Iron Man, mm -hmm. you know, criticizing, you know, his secretary. And then you have something like um, Batman v Superman, they use Charlie Rose, they use like mm -hmm. different people to sort of sort of connect that human element but sort of in a wider world. Creating a different world through technology. Mm -hmm. And and it's sort of um, like James Cameron's my favorite director and mm -hmm. he's an amazing builder of worlds of just putting us somewhere. And I think perhaps one of the issues with somebody just in an office is that we don't want our lives just to be in an office. Yeah. I would say like The Martian is a movie about, is a adult movie. Mm -hmm. And it's, I'm not saying like it has to be a guy in the office. That's probably the wrong way to say that. Well, but it just, I think what you mean is that it just has some realism, has some... No, it's not even that. I just don't want things blowing. I just don't want buildings falling down. I'm tired of buildings falling down. You're tired, you're tired of Michael Bay? <laughs> or like any movie, a building is falling down and being destroyed. It's like, cool, that's refreshing. I've seen that. I've seen that, yeah. So every week I'm looking at... Um, I'm looking at the releases for that week, and I'm like, oh, this sounds interesting, I'm going to go watch that. Um, oh, this sounds interesting too, I'm going to go watch that. And every week I'm just adding like eight movies to my to watch list, even movies, and I try to see everything. I'm, I saw Miracles from Heaven, despite the fact I have no interest in Miracles from Heaven at all. I saw, I, I'm just trying to see everything as one. And, I really think as students, um, if you really care about, because the thing, the truth is like, not as many people care about movies the way I care about movies, right? Mm -hmm. But if you do care, um, try and watch everything. Just try mm -hmm. and watch 
as much as you can. Watch the bad movie so you understand what makes a bad movie. Or for you, what makes a bad movie. Watch a great movie so you know what makes a great movie. Watch a middling movie so you know like what makes a um what makes a boring movie. Watch everything. I'm constantly afraid that I'm not catching up enough. And I think, um, and, and this will be the last point, I think that you make a very good, great point in a sense that, you know, don't be afraid to see a bad movie. And I think for average, you know, viewers is that, you know, you have $12, $13 to have a good time. You know, because for me, I go to the movies alone. And I remember one day my cousin saw me in the movie, he's like, you know, where, you know, why are you alone? And it's sort of like, no, I'm here like every, every other day. Um, and I think it goes into, you know, critics into the critics culture where you go to Rotten Tomato, you go to IBMD and then you see oh you only got like a 50%, you got like a 40% and then it's sort of like why would you even see, like I saw Fantastic Four even though people mm -hmm. get bombed, even though critics were just like don't even bother. Fell asleep to Fantastic Four. <laughs> you know, so it's, it, it's, sort of like a, it's sort of like we have a culture that loves to criticize movies, you know. Yeah. If in, in your opening weekend you know, if you are a big budget film and you get 30, 40 million, it's a bomb. You know, if, if your first week as a movie determines your lifespan, you know, and it's sort of like, you know, if Star Wars did not get, you know, over 100 million, it would have been a failure, even if the movie was really good. You know, Ender's Game was a movie I particularly liked, but, you know, it didn't get opening weekend. So you have an opening weekend culture where it's just like, it's either do or die. Yeah, but then. Go to a public library and get a movie. Public library is free. I, I have a great public library. I get many movies from it. And I'm not just saying, like, go to the theater watch it. Just, like, mm -hmm. don't watch Sweet Home Alabama for the 20th time. <laughs> just then, try something new. Try Election. Which also starts with Research. Uh, yeah, that is, that is true. Well, Patrick, thank you for thank being here. Thank you so much, bro. Yeah, thank you for joining us. Um, see you next time. Bye.